Good evening, Fernwood. It is your scrappy screwball, Neil, and it's time for us to scry into the past with another episode of Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. We are watching episode 293 today from May 18th, 1977, and you know, the release date of the video that you are watching is January 26th, 2022. That is a little landmark that I like to call my 51st birthday. I've been 17 three times in a row at this point. So let's just celebrate. Yesterday's episode started at breakfast with the Hartmans, Mary wondering why Tom was in such an awful mood. Tom focused on his paper and wouldn't eat the food that Mary put in front of him until she asked him about it. Heather comes down as Mary is asking if it has to do with Fiona Foley, who was visiting the other day. And then Heather reminds Tom about Mary and Dennis Foley having that affair last year. Mary tells Heather that that is not a good subject to be bringing up, and Tom says there's nothing to talk about, and that their marriage is perfect. Next door at the Haggers, Loretta is waiting with Dr. Maddock for Charlie to come home for lunch. Charlie's very excited because he has dropped off young JD for his first day of kindergarten, except that JD has come home for some reason. He runs in and scampers into his bedroom. The kindergarten teacher greets the Haggers and says that bad things have happened at school involving JD injuring some of the other children. And she says that he is a bad seed and that he might be backward. Dr. Maddock is sure that the child is not backward, but that he probably needs specialized care, which would involve him taking JD to his private zoo. Then at the Capri Lounge, Loretta and Charlie are musing on their sorrows as Loretta then sings a song to get out those painful feelings. They're joined by Tom, who doesn't say too much about what is making him unhappy. And then George comes in brandishing his new invention, the bug gun. He demonstrates exactly how it works, except that it doesn't go well and only creates a mess. However, Loretta is encouraging and says that as soon as George works out the bugs, she will buy the product for herself. George says that he and Tom are just two husbands that are down on their luck. And Tom says, no, things are going great. Loretta sees through this a bit and says there's got to be something that makes you feel better in life. At which point Tom takes a big drink. And then finally, at the Hartman home, Heather has decorated the kitchen in pictures of Dennis Foley. Mary comes in bearing the groceries and then notices that her former lover is plastered all over the kitchen. She thinks that this is an awful idea and that Heather had better take the posters down. And Heather says that to stay in the club, She's got to keep the pictures up for at least a week. Mary sends Heather to her room and takes a moment to compose herself, but before she can take any of the posters down, Tom comes back home and stands in stunned silence. Everyone, yesterday's episode hurt quite a lot, so, well, hopefully we'll get a little bit of comic relief today. I don't know. It's Wednesday. It's my birthday. Let's do this. <laughs> Mary Hartman! Mary Hartman! Oh, oh. Hey, come on in. Hey, excuse the clutter, but I'm just trying to replace my uh, chic, though somewhat avant-garde furnishings with uh, something more appropriately homey. Gosh, I wish Mary were here. She has such a, a flair for the mundane. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I sure was surprised uh, when you called. Oh, hey, let me turn that off. Yeah. Yeah, I'm awfully glad you came. Hey, go ahead, sit down. Make yourself comfortable. Uh, Tom. Mm -hmm. I have uh, a very embarrassing, albeit noble, statement to make here. Oh, I just want to apologize from the bottom of my heart about, well, about letting you languish in jail needlessly. Oh, 
come on, come on. That's, mm. that's, that's okay. I mean, uh, you know, it just uh, gives me something to talk about with the guys at the plant. Well, you, you have to understand my predicament, Tom. I, I did have a, a terrible choice to make uh, between my reputation and, and your life. Yeah, yeah. Well, well that's a hard choice. Mm. But you must admit that my uh, strong sense of ethic, combined with my flair for the dramatic, did save the day. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's, uh, there's something related to that subject that I'd, uh, I'd like to ask. Oh, sure, sure, go ahead. Well, you, you remember when I was in jail, how, uh, how depressed and helpless I was. Oh, listen, do I? You were pitiful. Yeah, yeah. And you remember when you uh, visited me at jail, uh, when we first became friends, uh, if you know oh, what I mean. Oh, Tom, come on. We were friends a long time before that. Yeah, yeah, well, you, you know the kind of friends I mean. Uh, yeah. The pitiful kind, on that specific night. Yeah, you mean the night I, I came to uh, comfort you and console you and uh, give you the chance to regain your manly dignity, mm -hmm. only for a brief moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah, the night. Yeah, what about it? Well, now, looking back on it and all, and, and, and knowing how guilty you, you felt about being an eyewitness to the fact of my innocence, uh, look, am I making myself clear? Not at all. Well, I suppose that when you, uh, when you, uh, well, you came there and we, uh, we, we did that thing, uh, you felt it was your duty, huh? Oh, absolutely. Uh huh? Well, well that's good to know. So, uh, you felt you, uh, had to do it for, for your conscience? Oh, no, no question. Uh -huh. Good, good, good. So, I mean, given other circumstances, you know, and like, say, if it were, were, were George, we're in the same spot, you, uh, you might have done the same thing, right? Highly possible, yeah. Uh -huh. And I suppose also that you might say, even though you weren't totally into it, you weren't uh, totally out of it, uh, like you, you didn't hate it, say. No, uh, I can't actually say that I hate it. Oh, come on, Tom, Tom. What? Don't you understand? I meant everything I said that night. I, I do think you're a wonderful guy, and oh. you needed a favor. That's all from oh, a friend, oh, okay? Oh, oh. oh, good, good, good. Then, then you're not saying I was uh, totally unattractive to you, huh? Basically, no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, good. I just wanted to, uh, you know, clear that up, you know. Not that it's, a, it's not important at all. Um, I mean, it doesn't really affect my manly dignity oh, or anything like listen. that. Well, listen, i got to be going. Uh, Tom. What? Uh, Tom, before you go, I, I'd like you to just kind of consider something for a minute, if you will. I... Mm -hmm. Now, if you hadn't been locked in that jail cell, you know, half crazy with anxiety and facing a death sentence on that specific night, would you have found me attractive? Honest now. Honestly? Yeah. No. You see? You know, it's like, it's like, um, it's like looking across a crowded room and catching someone's eye and exchanging glances and then suddenly realizing that you're not attracted to them at all. <laughs> It's great. It's great. <laughs> it's wonderful. Hey, hey, friends. Friends. She's sleeping. <laughs> shorts. What are the jockey shorts? Oh, hi, Kathy. So you're home? Just to do the laundry. Ma, mm -hmm. please come home. You're, you're a married woman. You need to be home. And besides, you're being terribly cruel to Daddy. And, and, and besides that, Mac, you're old enough to be Mac's mother, and this whole thing is a disgrace. Kathy, you gave me one good reason why I should come home. Because you're the one who always taught me that sex outside of marriage is dirty. I wasn't a very good teacher, was I? Oh, I'm ashamed to hear you talk that way. What are you doing? 
I'm just taking some of my cooking things over to the apartment. Oh, well, what are we supposed to cook with? Kathy, Kathy, don't raise your voice. Standing cow is trying to sleep. Ma, I don't think she's sleeping. Oh, what do you mean? Ma? What? She's dead. Oh, oh. Don't faint. Oh, I have every right to faint. A dead woman piled up on my kitchen table. Why shouldn't I faint? Well, uh, because it's not your kitchen table anymore. Uh, oh. oh, I'm not dead yet. I have unfinished Choctaw business. Oh, I see man like mountain who drives a truck, a big diesel Ford with overdrive. That's Mac. Martha Shumway. You must bid farewell to Fat Man's teepee, or you will bring mortal harm to the entire Shumway clan and Big Mac. That is my omen. Ooh. 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 Oh, oh, one more thing. Have a nice day. Took sick? No, 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 no. What's wrong with him, Doctor? I mean, he used to just run and jump at me all playful like and everything. What's wrong with him? Honey? Not a thing, Mr. Haggers. On the contrary, the boy has responded remarkably well to my training. Oh, uh, excuse me. Um, aren't you in the animal business? Uh, you must remember, Mrs. Hartman, that human beings are merely a higher form of animal. And it's because of that that the boy has, uh, has learned uh, and made such progress. Well, Doctor, you know a lot more about science and stuff like that than I do, but I ain't exact and precisely sure I know what you mean by progress, because it looks to me like he's progress backwards. Yeah. If you'd care to serve dinner now, I think you'll see some remarkable changes in the boy. Oh, uh, right, yeah. Um... Okay, I'll help you. Uh... Wait a minute, Dr. Maddox, isn't this what they call brainwashing? Well, hardly. <clears throat> Here, watch. Up, boy, up. Now, sit. Sit. Good boy. Oh, God, I wish Heather had such good table manners. Discipline is merely a, a matter of uh, letting the child know when it displeases you. No, bad, no. Dr. Maddox! Punishment for disobedience and reward for obedience. Observe. <clears throat> Johnny? Four. Up, boy, up. Now, stay. Stay. Good boy. Sit. Good boy. Good boy. There, you see. See what? Crime, and then I, I, I used to do that with my hound dogs. I mean... Man, that there is a human being. He was too long under the influence of Bigfoot. You see, the years between two and nine are the vital years for the development of purely human uh, faculties. He's had no human training in those critical years. Hmm. Do you think busing could have helped him at all? Joke. <clears throat> now, I've arranged with the Department of uh, Social Sciences to have the boy once a week for further training. Uh, wait, just, just oh, wait no, a minute, Charlie. Doctor. I ain't sure I cotton to that idea. No. 
Mm-mm. Well, I'm sorry you're taking that attitude, Mr. Haggers. I'm going to have to handle this matter as I think fit. And if you're going to interfere, I'm afraid I'll have to remove the child from your custody entirely. Now, wait a minute. Don't do that. Sir, I mean, you, you don't understand. See, my husband and I have really developed this deep love and affection for the child, and it would really break our hearts if, if you was to take him away from I mean, us. they are really, really and truly crazy about this kid. I mean, they feed him real food and everything. Then it's understood I'll have him once a week for continued observation and training. Okay, Dad. All right. Well, I don't know. I'm going to have to think about it for a few days. Johnny Doe, honey, come on, look at Mama. Come here. You want to give me an old time's sake smile? Come on. Johnny Doe. Loretta, think of it this way. He's wonderfully disciplined for a puppy. That was such a beautiful ceremony. One of the nicest funerals I have ever been to. It's too bad the guest of honor never enjoys a good funeral. Well, she's probably looking down on us from her happy hunting ground. Satisfied that we complied with her wishes and buried her out in our backyard. Well, I think it's spooky. We're now living next to a cemetery. Except for you, of course, you're living with Mac, which I think is also spooky. Uh, can I go watch bowling for dollars now? Kathy, this is no time for family arguments. Have a little respect for the dead. Why spoil a beautiful moment? I'm going. Mac, what are you doing here? I want to talk to George. Oh, well, today is a bad day. He is in an awful mood. Uh, that's right. More awful than his usual awful self, which is more than awful. Yeah, I, th and there was just a death in the family. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, Kathy, but, uh, well, this thing between Martha and me, we've got to get that straightened out right now. Boy, I'll never knock a grave digger till the day I die. I'm warning you, I just planted a standing cow out there, and there's still room for one longhorn bull. George, please, please, one funeral a day is more than enough. Oh, now listen, George, we gotta get some things sorted out here. Uh, uh, Daddy, just, just listen to him. Give him a chance, okay? Okay, Mac the Brahma. Say your last words. All right. First of all, Kathy, I'd like to apologize to you for... Well, walking out of your life the way I did, it couldn't be helped. I just, man, I just found your mother here more appealing. It's nothing for you to take personally. Well, I do take it personally. I don't like to be thrown over for a woman who is old enough to be my mother. Well, I'm sorry you feel that way, Kathy, but... Well, this thing between Martha and me, it's just... Well, it's bigger than both of us. Now, wait a minute, Buster. You're talking to my wife? And the mother of my daughter. Some mother. She steals my boyfriend right underneath my nose. It, it was George's fault. My fault? Yes, you treated me so badly that you drove me into the arms of another man. Why, well, are you red-headed yo-yo? What kind I of a do you think you are? I'm going to you to your shame as you get to your A woman needs love. Be quiet, you never. Just be quiet. I mean, look, I didn't come here to start no argument, you know? I came here to, to settle things that needed to be settled. Oh, and how do you propose to do that? Well, I'll tell you how I propose to do that. Now, there are several possibilities, right? I mean, there's several possible combinations. There's, there's me and Martha. <laughs> there's George and Martha. There's me and Kathy. There's me and nobody, which ain't nothing new. Look... I've got an idea. Why don't we set a target date one week from today, and then we have to come to a final agreement by then? Huh? It seems fair. Yeah, it seems all right to me. 
Oh, this is so sophisticated. I'll bet this is how Jackie Onassis and Henry Kiss and Jerry and Liz Taylor handle their lust and hanky-panky and other icky things. Oh, I'm so excited. I never thought I'd be a member of the Jet Set. <laughs> Hello, Tom. I'm glad I found your home. I'd like to talk. Oh, you mean you want to talk to my wife and my daughter? It seems like the uh, women members of this family happen to be members of your fan club. I uh, came by to return your gun. Court released it now that the charges against you have been dropped. Oh, thanks. And uh, while I'm here, I thought that... Uh, we might all have a little talk. Hi, Mary. Hi. Look, there's a lot of tension between all of us. And there's, there's no reason for it. I'm sure none of us enjoy it. And, uh... I think we could talk it out. Nothing to talk about. Tom, your wife and I had an affair. But that was a long time ago. And it's all over and done with. See, it is over and done with, and it's not coming from me. I should forget it then, huh? Oh, I'd like to. But there is still tension between us. All I'm saying is, I don't think there has to be. I'm, I'm your neighbor now. We're bound to bump into one another. I'd just like to get everything out in the open. Hey, look, Foley, you can sit here and sweet talk all night if you want to. Look, I still don't trust you. I know. And uh, I'm sorry about that. But I accept it. The important thing here, though, is, is that I like you, Tom. And I like Mary. And I'd like to think that you both like me. I think the two of you are great people. And I don't want to do anything to cause trouble between you. I wouldn't worry about that. I don't think there's any danger of that. Okay. Okay, so... Everything's out in the open now, so, uh... We all know where we stand, right? Uh, if you're gonna excuse me, I'm gonna go up, uh, upstairs, okay? Oh, wait, I'll, I'll go with you. No, no, that's You all right. can let you sit hey, down. Hey, 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 that's all right. Never mind, never mind. You can stay here. You can talk to him if you want to. It's all right. It's okay. Everything's fine, right? Huh? He's no threat anymore, right? Right? Thank you, Tom. Yeah. I'll be ready. Want some coffee? Thank you, but I have to run. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that you wanted to speak to me about something. About something? Yeah. What? Um. Uh, well, nothing, I guess. <laughs> hey, folks. Oh, they're fine. Oh, good. So they really like you. They can't wait to see you again. Can I take a rain check in the coffee? All right. Good night, Mary. Good night. I want you to know I think that this is the beginning of another wonderful friendship.
So the last couple of days, or yesterday for sure, was sucker punches, and today I just have chills. We have kind of two parallel scenes at the top and bottom of this episode, and we start with Tom checking in on Wanda Jeter. I had honestly forgotten, it's been a few days since I saw this, but I had honestly forgotten that they had sex when Tom was in jail that one day. And this isn't the reckoning that I suggested at that point. I think Mary still doesn't know that it happened. Or rather, I know that Mary doesn't know that it happened. I know it hasn't been brought up. This is Tom and Wanda taking an account of what it meant. That was the question that Tom left Wanda with that day, which was, does this mean anything? And this is them taking into, they're, they're, they're factoring through this situation that they are in. Wanda finds Tom to be attractive and also did this as a way of helping him because he was desperate that day. Tom says that if he hadn't been in jail under those circumstances, he wouldn't have found Wanda attractive. I don't know, though. I don't know what it m means past that. I feel like there's still some question that needs to be addressed. And some of that is what does Mary have to think about this? Or what does this mean for Mary and Tom's relationship? Perhaps it doesn't mean anything. Is That's one way it could go. If Tom and Wanda don't pursue anything outside of that one instance, then it's still hurtful considering how Mary feels about infidelity in their marriage at this point. It's a conversation that hasn't happened, but it definitely left me feeling tension. And the kind of tension that made me forget to breathe a couple of times, which is why I'm feeling tingles now. And then we get to the Shumway house with Martha cleaning up, right? Putting things away. I don't remember exactly what she was doing. She was doing something homish. Kathy shows up and Standing Cow is lying on the uh, table still. And this is that moment of fear. Standing Cow could have been dead right there. And then she wakes up. And she has a uh, portent to share, right? Like a, a, a prediction or a, a prophecy that if Martha stays with big man with truck, that she'll bring harm to everyone, including Mac. And then she dies. So I wasn't sure if she was dead with that howling at the end. It looked just like all of the other howling she's done, but... It certainly is spooky. And then another spooky scene where Dr. Maddock, and I only just realized that if you mispronounce it just a little bit, it kind of sounds like dramatic. Dr. Maddock brings back JD, who looks about as soulless as he ever has. He looks like he has no personality or joy and that he only knows how to follow orders. And I don't think that's how it works for dogs, at least the way I observe it. I feel like if a dog gets trained, like they enjoy doing the thing. Other animals are different. And in this case, JD has gotten some training that is suitable for animals. I, you know, nowadays you would use a clicker. There's that part of him though, that it's not showing in this scene, which is just that it seems like Dr. Maddock took away the wildness, but left really just a husk of a person. As much as Charlie and Loretta want to protest against this, Dr. Maddock has some power over them. He can take Johnny away permanently. For them to keep their boy in their life, they've got to let him, let Dr. Maddock have JD access once a week. I also remember that Mary made a joke about busing, which was a hot topic in the late 70s. Essentially, since neighborhoods are sort of racially and class-wise divided, busing was an attempt to even out the resources used by uh, communities and schools, right? So like kids from poor neighborhoods could be brought into richer neighborhoods and there are racial elements to that too that I, I'm probably a little bit ignorant of the actual situation to, to, to discuss. 
But that was sort of a topical gag that if you didn't know what was going on at that point, like if you lived in the modern day, in the 2020s, it wouldn't be a thing you'd know. I, by the time I was in high school, I feel like what was considered, what was, I, I don't have arguments for or against busing. I generally feel like it's good for kids to meet kids from different communities. It's good for students to learn from people who have different to learn around people who have different perspectives than them. But it's school, which is kind of crappy for a lot of people. So I don't have a good answer to that. But really, this is a scene about Loretta and Charlie doing their best for their son. And they're the best option there is something that's pretty horrible. Then we're at the Shumways right after having buried Standing Cow. I, I guess I wasn't expecting her to die so quickly. I, Of the deaths in this show, it was the least emotionally impactful. Like it, it even happened on screen and I literally didn't know that it happened until she was gone. So I couldn't be impacted by it like you know, honestly, we hadn't invested in that character. She seemed to be there just to, what, uh, give the prophecy to Martha and be a little bit of weirdness. But she has passed on and she's left her prophecy. And now the Shumways have to reckon with their situation. So will George and Martha get back together? Will Martha go with Mac? Potentially, will Mac get back with Kathy? Will Mac be alone? I mean, I have a feeling where this will go, but who knows? This show gets weird sometimes, so we'll see. And finally, we have a confrontation where Dennis comes with Tom's gun. We know it's never good when a character gets a gun. Dennis shows up and says that he wants to talk to Tom and specify that he and Mary do not have a romantic relationship and that Tom could let bygones be bygones, which is perhaps not reasonable to ask because Tom's emotions, that rage is something that you can't just ask someone not to be angry. You can ask it, but you can't make them be angry. You can't logic someone's emotions. Dennis stating his case to say that there is nothing going on First of all, as an outside observer, I'm not sure that nothing is going on, especially when Mary turns around and wonders if Dennis had something to say to her. I'm not sure if nothing's going on, really. I think that they're paying lip service to nothing going on. I think that down at the base of it, somewhere, a little light might be shining, and that might be the pilot light that bubbles this stove into a burning, boiling mess. I don't know what that is right now. I know that Mary has expressed that she has no interest in Dennis. I know that Dennis insists that they're friends. But yesterday, what the heck? The fan club was kind of ridiculous. And also, if the theory went as I understood it, Dennis talked to Trudy, who talked to Heather, who then put up the posters, we don't know how that happened. Perhaps Trudy asked Dennis to create a fan club and thus talked out the rules. I think it's a little gross to have a neighbor, <laughs> your neighbor, right? Trudy isn't, we've seen Trudy once ever in the show, so she's kind of a non-character. She's sort of like Heather's imaginary friend, really. Uh, but Trudy, this young girl is like, hey, neighborhood person, let's be your club of fans. Let's worship our neighbor, which is pretty odd, which, well, since we're in Fernwood, odd is par for the course. I think it's a little gross and occasionally gross is par for the course here too. So everyone, that was Wednesday. Woo, we have uh, more to come for sure. Still like six and a half weeks at this point. 
Thank you so much, everyone, for watching with me. Thank you for celebrating my third 17th birthday. Thank you so much for leaving your thoughts, feelings, and impressions down in the comments. And thank you for scrying into the past. We will see you tomorrow night in Fernwood.